Hi, this is your host, Sapnil Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And we are here at KubeCon in Detroit, and today we have with us, once again, Eldiko Vensha, Senior Manager, Community and Ecosystem at Open Infrastructure Foundation. It's great to see you again. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So first of all, talk a bit about uh, your presence here at KubeCon, because I do remember when it was Open Stack Summit, you know, th we, we, there were a lot of sessions on uh, Kubernetes, there are a lot of players uh, who were in, uh, very, very active in that. They're also very active in, you know, o o uh, Mirantis is there, you know, Platform 9 is there. They're like in both, you know. So when I look at it, I don't look at it as OpenStack versus Kubernetes. To me, it's always and story, you know. When we, especially when we talk about multi-cloud, it is, you know, we talk about not only clouds from different cloud providers, we also talk about on-prem. We also look at alternate providers like Linode. We also talk about mainframe because that's the heartbeat of modern economy, and that's where OpenStack, you know, with private clouds comes at play. So let's look at things from end perspective. It is interesting that, that you bring up, like, what do I do here, especially with that title that I have. Um, so as, as part of my job, I have a focus area on telecommunications, NFV, and edge computing. And I am also a community manager for one of our projects, and it's called Starting X. And that project happens to kind of be on the same page as you are in terms of OpenStack and Kubernetes being a plus uh, OpenStack and Kubernetes, like a complementary story, um, because Starting X is an open source uh, cloud platform. Uh, it is a fully integrated platform. It is optimized for edge and IoT use cases. And what it has to do with that kind of hand in hand story of OpenStack and Kubernetes, the project creates a fusion between those two open source projects. Um, and what it does is it deploys infrastructure, software, services in containers um, and you have Kubernetes on the platform layer as well to manage the infrastructure services and you also have access to Kubernetes uh, like on small edge sites if you want to have an edge sites that is container only then you can have that managed by Kubernetes and at the same time on the platform layer you have OpenStack services too so the the two are kind of really in a in a full fusion with each other um, and uh, uh, since starting X is a, an end-to-end -end edge infrastructure. So when you have your central cloud, um, then you have access to both OpenStack and Kubernetes for, for a full um, virtualized, containerized, bare metal workload management uh, with all the infrastructure services that you could possibly need. Since you talked about starting, so I want to just you know give our audience a bit you know insight. Talk a bit about the project. Tell what does it do? Who is it targeted at? Um, so the project is, as I mentioned, it is focusing on the edge computing space. Um, so the target is anyone really with an edge computing use case who is looking for an infrastructure solution. Because when it comes to edge computing conversations, someone is really focusing on edge sites themselves. Uh, there are many players out there who are bringing their applications, something new uh, or something existing but reimagined, uh, just because you know, the, the compute power and the concepts of cloud computing are now out at the edge, close to the end users, uh, both humans as well as machines. Um, so starting X really focusing, is really focusing on bringing that end-to-end -end infrastructure to you. So in that sense, managing um, massively distributed and geographically distributed systems for you. Um, the project is currently running in production at large telecom companies, um, which might you know strike a question like why um, but if you think about edge computing you probably also heard about 5g at the same conversation where edge computing happened um, telcos are pioneers in that space because edge computing is highly dependent on connectivity uh, and it kind of goes hand in hand with 5g and 5g is also using edge computing concept in terms of uh, revolutionizing telecom networks um, so starting x is currently running uh, um, at the data centers and uh, various locations of uh, Verizon's, Vodafone's, and T-Systems, um, backbone infrastructure powering 5G and uh, open RAN workloads. Um, so it is a really, really exciting phase for the project. However, um, the project itself is not 
tailored or targeted for the telecom segment. Uh, they are really just uh, the first players uh, who are rolling out uh, you know, production deployments and just really building out the infrastructure for all the cool edge use cases to come. Excellent. Uh, first of all, thanks for bringing 5G in there. Uh, I still remember, I think, uh, back in those when it was still OpenStack Foundation, you folks also tried to define what is edge computing, uh, you know. Uh, when we look at today's word edge computing, it can mean different things depending on who you talk to. It could be resource constrained data center at a remote location. It could be uh, an IoT device. It could be a device, you know, which is not sending too much packets because of regulations, whatever it is. So we, it's very hard to define what really is edge. Just, so when we do look at this edge use cases, it brings its own challenges. You talked about 5G. I think two or three years ago, the US government released, you know, some to, to kind of liberate 5G private networks as well. So talk a bit about, once again, because the world that we are moving towards, uh, when we talk about this cloud native, uh, first we used to have just one box running one application, then virtualization, then cloud, and now edge is the kind of future there. So talk about this evolution there, and then once again, the role of Starlink X project, or when you say telco versus, is, once again, a lot of times, you know, as you're working remotely, telcos, they do want to have those edge you know, near our, so that data can be sent back and forth easily. So talk about where the world is moving and how it all fits perfectly. Um, so, um in my experience, like when we talk about edge computing, it's my personal opinion. It's not necessarily a completely new paradigm. Like I've been in, in conversations just in the past few weeks. And again, as you mentioned, everyone has a different take on it. And uh, I just heard one comment that really resonated with me. Someone told me that, you know, we were looking into this whole edge computing thing and this edge computing space. And then we realized that it's just distributed systems. And they are not wrong. But as you also mentioned, it really depends on who you talk to, which means that the viewpoint and the context really matters. So what we started to do early on uh, with the OpenStack Foundation projects and ecosystem, and now the open infrastructure groups and, and ecosystem, we do have a, an edge working group there called um, Edge Computing Group, Opening for Edge Computing Group. So what we did is we came up with uh, the concept um, and scope that we care about. I mean, um, like defining, you know, the the end-to-end -end edge infrastructure as a scope for us. So when we talk about edge computing, what we look into is from that central cloud and data center out to the edge, um, as opposed to um, just, you know, looking at an edge side, looking at an application. So uh, edge computing really covers it all. It covers the end-to-end -end geographically distributed systems, but at the same time, um, uh, that is our scope and our context. So um, I'm really hoping that at some point we will be able to stop arguing about what edge computing is and everyone can just start with, hey, my scope is this, edge means this to me, and then I can, I can tell you what my scope is and then from there we can have a fruitful conversation. So when it comes to where the world is going, um, how I look at it is edge computing really is just kind of showing an evolution to cloud computing, if you will. So really how you can uh, use the concept um, tools, processes from the central cloud out at the edge to utilize the resources the most efficient way. Like there are a lot of talks both at this conference at KubeCon, but like in the open infra projects and ecosystem too about environmental sustainability. Like you have many, many resources running in the central data center, out at the edge, how you can utilize them the most efficient way so we can, you know, reduce a little bit of the power consumption, reduce a little bit of, you know, the CO2 emissions and all those kind of things. So in that sense, how you manage your resources, uh, it is really crucial both for cloud as well as the edge. And for that, uh, really understanding what cloud native as a concept and principles mean is crucial. 
And when it comes to projects like Starling X, what it does for you is it really handles the concept of dealing with that, managing and operating that distributed system. Um, like, again, conversations with others uh, where we always get back to everyone wants to have something simple. But when you have thousands of sites, how can that be simple? So what a project, again, like Starling X does, um, it takes those open source components that we mentioned and many more, and um, it helps you handle that complexity. Like it adds automation, it adds the ability to manage both hardware and software components, like carrying out patches to hundreds or, or thousands of sites. Um, the project has a single pane of glass dashboard in the central cloud and by a push of a button, uh, you can deploy patches on the edge sites. Like if you have you know, a security issue or um, or any feature enhancement, you can carry those out without sending a person out to every single site. So like those things that, that seem simple, um, they, they aren't always simple. And when you look into the open source ecosystem, those are the, the gaps and, and missing building blocks that the, the Starting X community is implementing that really makes sure that your end-to-end -end infrastructure looks like one whole system as opposed to uh, a collection of components that you have to figure out how to deal with them. I'll go back to the, the definition that you're talking about, Edge, the world we are living in. This may be totally unrelated and you're like, hey, this is a dumb question, is that if you look at, you know, Tesla cars, you know, or EVs, they are like more or less like, not exactly supercomputers, but a very powerful computers on wheels. Those cars are making a lot of decisions, so the, I look at them as edge devices. Right now, I don't know how much car Musk is selling, but Ford, we are here in Detroit, you know, all companies are moving to EV, and those are like, these are like more or less like powerful iPhones running, uh, taking us around then there'll be charging stations because they also have to be connected because you can find which charging station is available, which is not available. So I think the edge use case is about to explode with, with because people will be playing games on the cars, they'll be consuming you know, content on the car, and more important than that, the cars will be collecting a lot of sensor data in real time, making decisions at the spot. They don't have time to send all the way to the server to say, hey, is that a person or a box, should I hit him or not hit him? So, so talk a bit about how do you also see the things that are happening in the real world and where, 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 once again, the challenges and where we are heading there. Um, I think the uh, the automotive example is 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 a, a really nice one, uh, and the and the good one to mention. Um, it's also kind of interesting because if you look at the size of the car, um, then when we talk about edge computing, it's in a lot of cases, it's like, you know, resource constraints, really tiny uh, edge sites, and then you look at the car, which is usually huge. But at the same time, all the tiny sensors and the tiny computers in that car, just the car itself is, is almost a distributed system in itself. And um, I think that, that when it comes to edge computing and cloud computing concepts, uh, you also treat the car as an entity that has to be able to function autonomously. So um, to connect that back, for instance, to, to starting X and, and the concepts there, if you look at the car itself, that is an edge site and in a starting X deployment, the edge sites do have their autonomy um, and the project handles um, those sites that way. So if you lose connectivity between the central side and the edge side, the edge side still keeps full function, which in case of a car is crucial because again, if it doesn't have, you know, connection to, to a cell tower, then then what happens? Does the car stop? Does it hit somebody? Um, so um, it is definitely something that, that we really have to keep in mind that, that we are dealing with human safety, safety of equipment. Um, another example that is similar to the car is factory floors, for instance, uh, which is another use case for the project. Um, and the project uh, implements things like precision time protocol, uh, which 
is crucial for um, mission critical workloads. Again, human safety. If you think about all the robotic arms in the factory, like if something goes wrong, they could hit each other, they could hit a human being next to them. And that's, again, something that is unacceptable. So that is a mission critical workload that always has to be the priority. So whether we are talking about a project like Starting X or anyone working on uh, you know, applications or infrastructure components for the edge, I think that, that we are really moving towards um, like taking responsibility when we are developing software as well as hardware, because software is eating the world and, is in, and it is eating um, all these applications that has an effect on, on human life or has an effect on things like you know, global warming. So I think that it is also an exciting phase in terms of how everyone can contribute to uh, be part of creating uh, a more sustainable you know, life on this planet. And I think the fact that, you know, a lot of those components that will be and are in the car, in those robotic arm software, they are open source and people can come and participate in this. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps. I think it's just amazing because again, if you care about something like this, then you can, you can come and contribute to any of these projects. And it really doesn't matter which area you care about. Is it security? Is it sustainability? Um, it really is on you to, to choose the area that, that you would like to get involved. And, and you can help the communities and with that also the users out there um, to, to use all these projects as part of their real life when they are making a phone call, when they are buying the car that now you know, is able to drive autonomously sort of somewhat there are, there are already cars at least in the in the united states where you can already like just let the wheel go and see what happens um and as far as i know there there aren't a lot of accidents out there so it does work and now everyone out there who cares can come and participate to um you know create the the new versions of of all this and i i think that that is amazing so let's talk about the latest release of the project you know uh, some major functionality features. The project was launched uh, in 2018, uh, and the community came a long way since then. And they just released the uh, 7.0 release in uh, September, which was already a month ago. It's kind of unbelievable. Um, and it is really exciting because the community is working a lot on enhancing a lot of features and implementing new things in the project. So um, like, for instance, security is always the top of mind of the community. Um, and there are always uh, features and functionality um, that, that get added to the project. I think the, the latest is enhancements on audit logging, uh, for instance, and uh, the community is also working on things like certificate management, uh, which may not sound that complicated, but for instance, in the Kubernetes environment, uh, it can cause a lot of issues if you don't have automation around certificate management. So uh, that is also something that the community uh, was working on to add support for and improve. The other thing that I talked about is this distributed, con distributed cloud concept of the project. So that is another area that the community was working on to improve and add new functions. Um, so that component and that, well, it's an architecture choice as well as uh, functionality within the, uh, the platform. So for instance, um, the community added an interesting feature, which is uh, support for local installation, which actually means that if you happen to have, you know, a person on site with the um, uh, the software ISO, then they can install the edge site and connect it uh, to the distributed environment, um, as opposed to needing to download an image uh, from the central cloud, or you you don't even really have to have the human there, just making sure that you have the ISO locally. Um, the point is to really make sure that you don't have to rely on bandwidth and you don't have to wait um, sometimes, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of times to download 
uh, an image. So there is support to um, really make it more efficient to deploy the end-to-end -end infrastructure. Um, the other things I mentioned, the precision time protocol. So the 7.0 release um, adds um, more options to configure. Uh, the components uh, that implement that protocol within the platform. Um, and it also adds support um, for components that are crucial for 5G, because 5G is, uh, is a use case example that is highly dependent on something like PTP. Um, and um, well, uh, as a reaction to recent ecosystem changes, the platform is also um, now adding support for the Debian operating system. Uh, the platform does have uh, Linux operating system integrated in it. Um, and uh, at the start of the project that was uh, CentOS, and now the community is working on adding support for Debian. So there is a preliminary uh, trial version of that platform available in the 7.0 release and the full functionality is expected to be available in 8.0 that the community is currently working on. So that is another um, bigger change um, that the uh, the 7.0 release started to add. And just in general, um, um, like I can say that every single release and release cycle is focusing on security and scalability and you know more features and functionality for automation. Um, and upversioning of all the components that, that the platform depends on. And also, even with the, uh, the move to Debian, um, the project is still integrating a real-time kernel from the, from the Yocto project. Again, uh, 5G use cases like industrial, automotive, all the examples that we talked about, they are all dependent on that kind of functionality. Eldigo, thank you so much for taking time out today and, of course, talk about the foundation, the open source project, and larger open source story, which is the end game, not versus game. Thanks for those insights. And as usual, not only I'd love to have you back on the show, but I also love to return to uh, open infra you know, you know, events as well. But I really love talking to you today as well. Thank you. Thank you so much.